morning, I'd invite you to take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Ecclesiastes. That's kind of in the middle of your Bible. If you were to go over to the middle of your Bible, you'll see the book of Psalms. And then if you're moving toward the New Testament, the next book you come to is the book of Proverbs. And right after Proverbs is the book of Ecclesiastes. The book of Ecclesiastes was written by the son of David, a man by the name of Solomon. Solomon has some wisdom. In fact, he was called at one point, other than Jesus Christ, he was the wisest man in the world. And even the wisest man in the world, when he gets his eyes off of God and on himself, becomes the most foolish man in the world. But God used him to write a book called the book of Ecclesiastes. And here's what I like to do. I'd like to read it out loud. I'm going to read it out of the King James. And you read along with me in your Bible. And our topic today is the value of friendship. And I'm so thankful that you're here and that we are friends and that we can go to the scripture and study this topic of friendship. God writes in verse 9, two are better than one. Because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, the one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him that is alone when he falleth. For he hath not another to help him up. Again, if two lie together, then they have heat. But how can one be warm alone? And if one prevail against him, two shall withstand him. And a threefold cord is not quickly broken. May the Lord bless his word. I want us to just think this morning a little bit from the Word of God and may His Holy Spirit enable us to understand and to apply this to our lives today. This value of friendship. I went to the uh, Merriam-Webster and looked up that word friend. I enjoy doing that. and I like to get the root meaning of words. A lot of times there's these big words, and I'm like, what in the world does that mean? Like uh, a word that I looked up the other day, I had no clue what it was, I read it. Metacognition. I'm like, what? Metacognition. So I looked up metacognition. I'm no better for it, but I at least now know what it means. <laughs> uh, it means multiple uh, intelligences or knowledge, okay? But uh, anyway, friend. Merriam-Webster says, A friend is a person who is attached to another by feelings of affection or personal regard. Look at that. Two, two aspects, this dictionary says, define a friend. They have affection and personal regard, or we could say loyalty or respect. And I've always said this, that a good friend is someone who gives their affections and loyalty to another person. If you have someone who has no affection towards you or loyalty towards you, you do not have a friend. We may say you're our friend. We may say I'm your friend. But if there's no affection, we call that love, and loyalty to you, uh, that's not a friendship. And I want to tell you we're all guilty of not being good friends. We're all guilty of not being that friend to someone in their time of need. And here's what I want to do. I, I, I want to personalize this message for me. And I want you to personalize it for you. Have you found that there's value in that when you do that? Because it's so easy for us to focus outward. Okay? I'll pick on Dan. He's my son-in-law. He's such a blessing to me. But, so I can do this with Dan because it's not real. But if I were to like preach and I'm focusing on Dan and I'm like, I'm going to... I'm going to let him know he's not a good friend. He doesn't love me. He doesn't have any loyalty to me. And I'm preaching it, Dan. I just missed the whole message. And I'm worse for it. You see? And, and if we're not careful, that's what we do. We all do it. I do it. You know, we, we, we do that with our spouse, with our kids, with our brothers and sisters, people at work. You know? If we're going to get the most out of God's word, we've got to say, it's me, it's me, it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. You know, I want to be a better friend. And so let's go to the word of God and let's say, OK, God, if you're a friend to sinners, to people that are not very lovable, who don't deserve your loyalty, 
then how much more a sinner should I be a friend to you and a friend to others? So a person attached to another by feelings of affection or personal regard. Well, that, that works. And here's some, you've heard these before. A friend is someone who knows all about us and still likes us. You like that one? I've just come to the place at 52 years old. I'm just going to be honest with you. I, you know, people ask me, hey, how are you doing, Pete? And I'll say dazed and confused. I'm just past trying to put on a good show. And they get a laugh. I don't care. Daisy. I'm flawed. I'm broken. I'm sick. But you know what? I'm not content to be there. It's not a cop-out to be there. I'm just saying, hey, I recognize that this is where I'm at. And if I don't put my dependence upon you, Lord Jesus, today, that's how I'm going to live today. And you know what? There's people in my life that know me, and if you've been around here for six years, you know me. But you still like me, enough that you're willing to still let me be your pastor. And, and, and there's a degree of loyalty toward me. And I have that same towards you. And you know what? Because of that, we're friends. People know us better than we think they know us, don't we? Come on now. Don't... You know, and it goes back, you know, we are very observant people. So here's the thing. A church is a, is a place, it's supposed to be a place that we can be safe and we can get irritated with one another. We may even get mad at one another. We may even say something to one another, but you know what? We go back and it's okay. We make it right. Uh, some of you know I'm a bivocational uh, pastor. I work another job. And yesterday... Um, I had someone in my group irritated another person. See, even, even at work, we have conflict, right? They were irritated another person because they did something, and they called me, and they wanted to grouse to me about the other person. I said, hey, I said, we've worked together way too long. They did not do that intentionally. We have a professional friendship. They did not intentionally mean to do what you think they did. And that person got very angry with me, and, you know, and, 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 um, and I, I stood my ground politely, and I said, no, that's not, you know, and da 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 and hung up mad. Now, we're friends. About a half hour later, I get a call. Man, I'm so sorry. I apologize. I wasn't right to me. And I said, hey, it's okay. I understand. If I were in your shoes, I'd probably be the same way. You know, and, and we worked it out. Because we're friends, you see? And if we can do that at work, can't we do that at church? See? Someone who knows all about us and still likes us. That's the, coolness, the cool thing about marriage. Is you value, you value companionship above perfection. And you actually begin to love that person even more because of their imperfections. Because that's what makes them different. That's what makes them the person they are. All the package. And you say, I just love everything about you. And I accept you. I'm not going to try to change you. Man, what a, what a great place to be. And because they so much love you, they want to please you. And you love them and that you want to please them. You know, I want to tell you, I didn't feel when I got up this morning... Now, I do believe God does, you know, bring uh, His Word, and, and, and when we're out of line, He'll convict us of it, but He does it in a way that's a way to say, I love you too much to keep, to leave you alone. You're hurting yourself. It's, it's actually something we ought to thank God for. But you know, God didn't beat me over the head today. God didn't badger me. God didn't, you know, like, make me feel like dirt today. I, I sense the love of God, the presence, the peace, the acceptance of God. And He knows me. And that's what we're to be like to one another. Hey, here's another one. A friend is someone who walks in when the world has walked out. You, you guys heard this before, right? I love that. They're very, very rare. By the way, one person said, at the end of your life, if you have six people who call you their friend, carry your casket to the grave, you've had a successful life. Because most people don't. Most people could not say, I have six dear friends as pallbearers to take my body to the grave. 
And this, this person said, hey, if you, if you come to the end of your life and you have six friends as pallbearers, you've had a successful life. Friends are rare. Here's one from Chuck Swindoll. We all know Chuck Swindoll. He uh, was the president uh, at uh, Dallas Theological Seminary. Here's what he said. He said, the neighborhood bar is possibly the best counterfeit that there is to the fellowship of Christ, to the fellowship Christ wants or desires for his church. It's an imitation, dispensing liquor instead of grace, escape rather than reality, but it is a permissive, accepting, and inclusive fellowship. It is unshockable. It is democratic. You can tell people secrets, and they usually don't tell others, or even want to. The bar flourishes not because most people are alcoholics, but because God has put into the human heart the desire to know and be known, to love and be loved. And so many seek a counterfeit at the price of a few beers. How many of you remember uh, back in the 90s there was a sitcom, sitcom called Cheers? Anybody, anybody remember that? Their theme song. Here's their theme song. Sometimes you want to go where everybody knows your name. And they're always glad you came. You want to be where you can see our troubles are all the same. You want to be where everybody knows your name. And it's sad that was written about a bar instead of the house of God. <coughs> if we could, uh, I'm speaking to myself. Look, this is about me. This is about you. Don't be thinking of other people. See? If we could just loosen up and just let go of our sanctimonious piosity and just say, hey, this is who I am. I am processing into greater Christ-likeness and God is patient and it takes time. So with that said, let's read this again. Would you read it with me as a group? Let's read it out loud. Okay? Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, one will lift up his companion. But woe to him who is alone when he falls, for he has no one to help him up. Again, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one be warm alone? Though one may be overpowered by another, two can withstand him. I want you to look at that passage now. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to take those uh, four verses. And we're going to just go down through it. And I want you to see in verse 9, it says, Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. Notice that. They have a good reward for their labor. And that's an interesting phrase, this thing of two. And the thought is that you're yoked together, that you're friends, that you're sharing life together, you're experiencing life together. And the words good reward can also be translated good return. Because it means dividends paid on a wise investment. You know where I'm going with that. So the very best investment you can make in your life is not a financial one, but it's a, an investment made in relationships. Think about that. You know that's true. I don't know about you, but the more stuff I get, I'm not saying I don't need it. I say that carefully. But you know what? When I get more stuff... Do you find that it takes more time and money to maintain it? And I'm like, do I own this or does it own me? And we get so complicated with our life that we miss the main reason we're here. And the point of it all is, is there's nothing wrong with having tools and toys as long as they help build relationships and they don't control our lives. But when we begin to use those tools or toys in such a way that we're having to work more or we're having to put more effort into maintaining them that we're neglecting our relationships, then that has become a curse. And so I want you to think about that investment. And then notice, if you will, there's four characteristics of a friend. The first one I see here is in verse 10. A real friend helps you when you're down. Notice verse 10 of Ecclesiastes 4. For if they fall, 
the one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him that is alone when he falleth, for he hath no, he hath not another to help him up. You ever been in a place in your life where you're just at a rock bottom? I mean, you just hit bottom. And you have no one around, it seems, to help you up. There's, there's just no physical person that has come to help you up. And God says that's a terrible place to be. To have no one there to help you up. I want to ask us a question here. If you've experienced that, let that spur you on to be used of God to go to that one who has no one to help them up. Oftentimes, the the wounds of our life and the, and the, the sorrows of our life can be used by God to so impact us that we can then be a help to others in a way that we never could otherwise. I want you to think right now of some people that are just at a real low place and be that friend and go to them. And don't don't try to lecture them and don't don't try to fix all the problems, you know. Just go and do what? You you guys know. What what should you go do? Listen. Listen. Be there. Pray for them. Pray with them. What else? Love them. What's their need? Maybe they need a meal. Maybe they need to be taken out to a restaurant. Maybe they just, maybe they need their house cleaned. I don't, I don't know, but you're a friend. You can't, you can't go to everyone, but you can go to someone. And if all of us would go to someone, there would be a whole lot more people helped in that place of darkness. And I want to tell you what, all of us have those times of darkness. And so I want you to think right now, who could I show some love to and some regard for by me taking some time or effort or money or talent or whatever and just going and being with? And I want you to do that this week. Another characteristic of a friend is a real friend is someone who provides emotional or physical warmth in a cold, cruel world. Notice verse 11. It says here in verse 11, Again, if two lie down together, they'll keep warm, but how can one be warm alone? (coughs) You know, we're all concerned about our 401Ks, or maybe some are. Pension, Social Security, will it be there? By the way, Jesus answers that in Matthew 6. Jesus said, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. But when you invest your life in another person, in your love, and in your regard for them, you're laying up treasure in heaven, an investment that pays great dividends. And so here's something I want to ask you. Who is in your life that you know is emotionally hurting? And they're in that cold, cruel world, and if they're left to themselves, they can be greatly damaged. You know, one of the things that's always a, always just a tragedy is when a, a teenager <coughs> takes their life. You know, and everyone involved in that young person's life, they, they have kind of a crisis themselves if they love that young person. Like, why didn't I see it sooner? Or why didn't I detect it? Why didn't I go? What would have happened if I'd have done this? And... And it's just a sorrowful time for everybody. I was just reading about in the, uh, in the news about this uh, army psychologist. And he spent 15, year, uh, 15 months over in, uh, in Iraq, actually, in uh, some of the fear, most fiercest fighting in 06 and 07. <clears throat> during that battle for Fallujah time and all that uh, heavy fighting was going on. And, and he was known as the go-to person when you experienced or saw traumatic things. 
you could go to him and, and he was accepting and he was caring and, and he knew just how to help that young, that young military person. He comes back to the States and teaches at a college and his marriage falls apart and he's suffering from PTSD. And he helped all these people. And now he needed help. And there was no one there for him. And so he takes his life with a pistol this last week. And everyone's like, how did, how did we miss that? How did we miss that? You see, and, and every one of us have someone in our life right now that is broken and hurting and trying to find their way. And you are in a better place. And you have a responsibility, an obligation to go to them. And just be with them and love them. And show regard for them. Not to lecture them. To encourage them. There's just a lot of pain in this world. We, we've all experienced it, but here's the issue. A real friend is someone who comes and provides that emotional warmth, that physical warmth. And just is there. You're praying for them. And by the way, you know it if you're a Christian. Um, when people are praying for you, you can often sense it. I, I can't explain it. But you can feel it, can't you? There's a, look, there's, a, there's, there's so much sorrow in this world and there's great joy in this world, but we have been called to be like Christ and to reach out in the love of Christ. And, uh, you know, the old saying is people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care, right? right. And uh, that's why you, you, you look at Christ and he was, he was compassionate. He was caring. He was giving. He was loving. And, uh, and so that's what a Christian is to live like. I want you to see that another characteristic of a friend is a real friend is someone who will fight to protect you or your reputation. In verse 12 it says, Though one may be overpowered by another, two can withstand him. And what they're talking about there is in the uh, ancient times when this was written, in the days of King David and King Solomon, when they would fight uh, on the battlefield, you know, they would have uh, very crude instruments of, of war, and, uh, and they would often be in the thick of of this hand-to-hand -hand type of brutal con combat. And, and you would literally, in many cases, fight back-to-back. -back. And you would protect the person's back as you fought. And they would protect your back as you fought. And so on. And here's the, here's the idea here. The one may be overpowered by another if you're standing by yourself. Two can withstand him. And when Satan comes at us, we need, we need people who will stand with us and who will love us and support us and pray for us and encourage us. And fight to protect you. Jesus Christ, He, he models that for us. In fact, we're told that right now He's standing at the right hand of the Father on high and He is our advocate. When Satan comes to accuse you, to slander you, to come after you, your reputation, Jesus is saying, no. He's mine. He's under the blood. He's as righteous in my Father's eyes as I am. Get behind me, son. He has our back. In fact, in the Old Testament, we're told that God, to His people, is a rear guard. He has our back. You know, you've often heard in Ephesians 6, it talks about the, the armor of God that we're to put on. And you'll, say, you know, you'll often hear, well, there's, no, there's nothing to protect your back. You, it's all offensive. You're going forward. I disagree. Jesus has my back. He's my Amen. rear guard. He's the one that is around me and protecting me. So let me ask you a question. Who do you know that is just being attacked you can go to and you can stand with and you can love them and you can encourage them a real friend would and then we see in, in Proverbs 27 17 a real friend is committed to helping you grow spiritually in Proverbs 27 verse 17 it says as our iron sharpens iron a friend sharpens a friend and here's the thought it's a, it's a, it's a picture of a blacksmith He's got his iron hammer and he's got a piece of iron and he's put it in the fire. 
Oh, that fire is painful, but it's purifying and it softens us. And it prepares us and makes us moldable. And that iron ha- hammer comes down on that iron rod and is beat. And it's painful. And it's not pleasant. And you'd rather it not happen. And you begin to see a beautiful sword, for instance, coming into shape. And that's what a good friend will do for you over the years. They don't beat you to death. They're not pummeling you. And, but once in a while, a well-chosen word at a well-chosen time. That's the problem, isn't it? <laughs> Easy to say. But they have such effect in our lives. I'm so thankful for my friends that have my back and they'll point out blind spots to me. And uh, I got a call the other, this other week and, and, and he was so, uh, he was so uh, concerned that he might hurt me in some way and I was like, thank you that you called and let me know because I wouldn't have known. I was blind to that. A real friend is committed to helping you grow spiritually. And you know the difference, don't you, between someone that wants to just hurt you and someone that wants to help you. See, that's the key. You love me. You're committed to me. You respect me. You have regard for me. I want to hear what you have to say. Not that we shouldn't hear it from our enemies, because there's a lot of truth there as well. (coughs) There they're going to pummel you to death if they can, right? And that's where you need your friend to say, hey, you know, I'm going to help you. I'm going to protect you here. Yeah, what they're saying is true, but... So, a friend of God. John 15, 12 through 15, Jesus said this, This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friend. Are you willing to lay down your time to help your friend? Are you willing to lay down some money to help your friend? Are you willing to... Go out to go to extend yourself to help your friends. See, that's what friends do. You lay down one's life for his friends. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends for all things that I heard from my father, I have made known to you. We're told that Adam walked with God in the cool of the evening in the garden. He was a friend of God. Abraham was called a friend of God. God told things to Abraham that he never told to anyone else. We know Moses was a friend of God. I think about Enoch too. Enoch walked with God. He was a friend. Such a dear friend. In fact, that God said, you know what? I'm just going to bring you home with me. And he said, Enoch walked with God. and was not for God took him. God is our friend. And God says, I want you to be my friend. And the way you're my friend, the way you say I love you, God, is you keep my commandments. You obey me. And one of the things God wants us to do is to love our neighbor as ourselves. Let me ask you a question. What are you lacking in your life right now? Are you lacking friends? A man that has friends must show himself friendly. I've learned that if you give, you shall receive. That works positively and negatively. It's a principle. I'm going to ask us to bow our heads just for a moment before we receive the offering. Consider this thing of friendship. I believe God has put someone in your heart Probably not a lot of people, but maybe one person. Maybe two people. They need your friendship right now. They really need you. They need a card. They need a call. They need a visit. They need meals. They need help. They just need to know you're there for them. I want you to make a commitment to God that by His grace you're going to be that friend. And then I want to speak to that person here this morning as our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. Are you a friend of God or are you alienated from God? 
friend of God is someone who says, God, I want to be right with you. I want to be your friend. I want to walk in your ways. But you know you're not right with him. You know you've never received Jesus Christ as your Savior. So here's what I want us to do right now. Let's go to our Lord in prayer. You know, Jesus said, my house should be called a house of prayer for all people. We've prayed for others today. Let's pray for you today. And if you're lost and on your way to hell without Christ, I want you to make a U-turn today. We call that repentance. And I want you to pray this prayer with me and mean it from your heart. Dear Lord Jesus, I confess to you that I am going the wrong way. I know that I am not right with you. I have hurt many people. I have done many things that I know are not pleasing to you. Lord, I am a sinner. And I know that if I die in my sin unforgiven, I'm going to hell. I do not want that, Lord. I do not want to have a ruined life in this world or the next. And so I come to you and I put my trust in you, Lord Jesus. And your shed blood that you shed for me on that cross. And I ask you, in faith, to forgive me of all my sin. I ask you in faith to save me from a life of ruin in this world and hell in the next. I trust you and you alone to save me this moment. I thank you for hearing my prayer. And I invite you the best way I know how, Lord Jesus, into my life. I acknowledge you as my Savior and my Lord. Thank you for hearing me. Thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. This week, I want you to go to that person, maybe even today, make a phone call. All right? And then here's the thing. Let's be a church that's better than any bar. Let's be a church that's better than any TV sitcom. I, 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 I want to tell you, by God's grace, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I will never expect perfection from you. <laughs> Don't do it to me. But I want to also tell you that I'll, I'll seek to stay humble and repentant and confess where I have wronged you. Just like that, that person at work, a lost person at work, did to me yesterday on the phone. I can do that. You can do that. A great exercise is to take responsibility for yourself. Because I tell you what, there's enough we can look out and say, oh, well, that excuses me because they're not, they're not, they're not, they're, not, they're, they're you know. So a good friend. <clears throat> Proverbs 17:17 17, 17 says, "A friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. Let's love at all times. Let's be a friend to those that are in adversity. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine upon you and give you peace this week.